Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start off by saying, proposing a, a great vote of thanks to Garrick Israelian, because it's because of him that we're all here having this wonderful experience. So I'd, maybe a round of applause for Garrick. I could in some sense be perceived as a kind of ideal contributor to the Starmus conference since I carry credentials from both music and astronomy. But in this company, particularly the company sitting in the front row here, all I feel is, is humble. And um, my qualifications in a, as an astronomer um, is I, I have an astrophysics PhD from Imperial College on the motions of interplanetary dust and my credentials as a musician are 40 years recording and touring the world as a member of the rock group Queen and also as a solo artist. As an astronomer, I could probably very easily speak to you in depth and with confidence on the motions of interplanetary dust. As a musician, as a musician I could speak to you with some authority on what it's like to play an A chord at 100,000 watts in Wembley Stadium. But the subject I have chosen to speak on today, and the subject that Garrick actually asked me to speak on, because it's something we have spoken about many times over the years, is a subject which I really can't approach with confidence. I approach it with a lot of trepidation, because I cannot be an expert in the area that I'm speaking in. I also feel the weight of worry that what I'm contributing may sound negative, and almost ungrateful in the company of our brilliant guests, men who have trod the moon and in space. Um, I stress there is a lot of conjecture in what I'm saying, and I'm hoping that uh, our honored astronaut guests will be able to put me straight on where I'm talking out of my hat later on. But I hope that you will trust that my heart is good in saying what I'm gonna say. So I stand before you today really neither as a scientist or as an artist, uh, or as a musician, but just as a human being. Maybe we need to turn this down a little because it's squeaking. A little bit of feedback there. So this will be entirely non-technical. I suppose I have an unusual viewpoint in a sense because although my viewpoint is not quite as unique as, as an astronaut, I've seen some extremes of the environments of pure art and pure science, and I've seen quite a lot of this world in unusual ways. I have to say I've been enchanted by the talks at this conference, enchanted, blown away, stimulated, astounded, because the speakers have all been able to answer so many questions about what we know about the universe that we live in. But I won't be answering any questions in this talk. I will only be answering, asking a question. My mission here today is to ask the question that I do not intend to answer, but I hope to stimulate some discussion among the assembled company. Most of you here today are not only at the pinnacle of current thought, but influential in the world at large. So I regard this as my opportunity. My question is simple. What are we doing in space? I have only one slide, and this is it. <laughs> because and you'll notice the Earth is small in this. I, most people have the Earth big. I have it small and a lot of space around it, a lot of room to think. But I want you to look me in the eyes, really, when I say this. On the surface, okay, this is a purely factual question, you know, what is currently happening in the human race's exploration of the space around our planet? But most of that has been answered already in this conference, and very exciting it is too. My inquiry extends deeper, really, to the question of what our motives truly are in our further exploration, and ultimately, to whether the motives on which we are acting stand up beside our picture of the human race in the context of the universe as a whole. In case that doesn't make sense, to cut to the chase, what I'm saying is now that the door to the conquest of space has been opened by brilliant scientists and engineers and brave explorers, is the rest of mankind ready or even worthy to walk through that door? Question, if we walk through in bulk, what will we take into space? Well, how did this begin? Amazingly, it's half a century since man first ventured outside this thin layer of life-giving atmosphere which surrounds our little planet. 
In the 1950s and 60s, we saw two powerful nations, USA and what was then called the USSR, who were in a state of so-called cold war with each other, both pumping money and human ingenuity into building space rockets to take man into space. The first steps were very much like Jules Verne's projectile, a capsule shot into near space and allowed to fall its natural parabolic trajectory back to Earth. But the crucial thing is that it was established that a man could survive in the near vacuum of space. The venerable Leonov, who you've seen here, proved this by his personal courage. And they could survive using a microcosmic support system inside a metal container, the first manned space vehicles, or even outside the capsules in the first spacesuits. So it was established that man could go into space. What ensued was a space race, a rush to be the first nation to put a human foot on the moon. Why? Well, why? Was it in the spirit of exploration, of discovery, of pure human curiosity? Yes, of course, it was all these. We know that the two men behind the American and the Russian in initiatives, von Braun for the Americans and Korolev for the Russians, had dreamed of a moon landing all their lives. But if human curiosity was the only motive, why did the two nations not collaborate? What a wonderful way it would have been to mend bridges, to work on such a noble project hand in hand. But of course they didn't. Why? Because the whole subtext of this endeavor was, just as it had been 40 years earlier for von Braun in Germany, making V-2 rockets to bomb London, military. In Russia, Korolev was doing the same job as von Braun was for the Americans. The dreams were there, shared by the astronauts, the engineers, the astronomers, the whole huge technical team who worked on this project. But why did it get the billions of dollars that it needed in funding to make it happen? I can't avoid the thought that it was because of quite different reasons. Not only did the conquest of the moon look like it could give superior firepower and su superior spying power for the nation who got there first, but the prestige, the bravado, the impression of military might had to be huge. It had to be something which would frighten all nations into submission. Um, the power behind the two national efforts was in fact military. From then on, one wonders what happened to the motivation, the power. Yes, there were more moon landings. We've seen this today. Twelve people, twelve brave men have walked on the moon. And I'm full of awe and full of admiration for these people. It seems strange to me. Now we are almost 50 years on. And how is it that this huge momentum to achieve this massive advance did not get translated in this incredibly long time, half a century, into colonization of the moon, colonization of the moon by now? It's an odd question to answer. Those 50 years have seen thousand-fold leaps in expertise, computer technology, the birth of the internet, etc., etc. So how come this outreach into, sp into space actually slowed down? Buzz told us in his address to us yesterday that after the, the clear objective of the first moon landing had been achieved, it became harder to become clear about what the objective was now and harder to keep the support for the continuing exploration going. Yes, that must be so. But it's tempting for me to theorize that the military powers that be did not see any immediate advantage in pursuing this path after a while. They turned their eyes in other directions. And they were actually very open about it. So while Kennedy spoke of man's ambition to explore the cosmos in the pursuit of pure knowledge, not too long after, the word Star Wars was coined to describe the ambitions of a very different emphasis of the development of unmanned weaponry in space, instigated by President, President Ronald Reagan, Reagan in the 1980s, the Strategic Defense Initiative. During this time, the moon was left alone. I can only guess, but I look at a reason, this is perhaps more whimsical. Um, I'm involved in trying to get some money to um, to study the zodiacal lust, dust further, and we're failing miserably. Um, we're asking for probably about 10,000 pounds 
um, to repeat the experiment that I did for my PhD. Really, it's pure knowledge. It has no application. But it will tell us something about the dust clouds that surround stars, and particularly our star. Meanwhile, I contrast this with the roughly $330 million that were allocated for NASA to hit Comet Temple 1 with a projectile. <laughs> and please don't tell me that military considerations have nothing to do with the decision-making process. I don't doubt the sincerity of the scientists who pulled off this wonderful feat, but how jolly for the politicians to be able to demonstrate to the world that the USA can hit a target at 100 million miles. So I would say the prime motivation, and it's, it's putative, but the, perhaps the prime motivation for much of the money allocated to space exploration is evidently still tied up with the military and with political power. If this is true, are we happy with this? Does this give us the right kind of motivation to continue our march into space? Question, is this what we take into space through that door into the future? Do we take military ambition? Do we take economic ambition? Politics, economics, and the military always seem to conspire very well together. Do we take the greed and selfishness of big business into space? Will we rejoice when we get off that lunar shuttle in seeing a McDonald's sign or a Kentucky Fried Chicken, Gucci, L'Oreal, hedge funds, insurance brokers? Again, I don't have the answer. What else do we take into space? Well, probably a continuation of our present behavior on Earth, right? We need new lands, do we? The Earth is no longer big enough for us, right? I actually wrote a song about this many, many years ago. It was called 39, where the uh, astronauts go off and look for new lands, and humanity is able to migrate to, to new places. Um, but should we look for a moment to the damage we've done already to our own beautiful planet, a planet so uniquely, perfectly suited to our needs and the needs of all the creatures who, as Richard Dawkins has reminded us, are each at the pinnacle of their evolutionary path and worthily share the Earth with us. Slide number one. Looking at our planet from afar, it looks so peaceful, so clean, gentle, and unsullied. It evolved over millions of years with its flora and fauna, its delicate and precious balance of emergent life, which may or may not be unique in the whole universe. But this paradise, this Eden, is not showing us the hurt that it's endured in the mere couple of hundred years since man became all-powerful. It's hard to imagine now what Earth was like just 300 years ago before we covered it with roads and concrete and fast food chains. It was literally teeming with life. It's said that when Captain Cook first dropped anchor in the Seychelles, they looked around the waters and there were so many turtles in the sea that you could walk on them all the way to the shore. Those of us who, perhaps like myself, have been diving for many years know how different the seas look under the surface these days. It's, this is all whimsical, but it's said that, that when the last rail was laid on that first railroad across the USA, you could travel from coast to coast, and there was never a time when you couldn't see buffalo. What happened? What did we do to our beautiful planet? Where do we start? Garrick pointed out to me, ironically, we have produced so much light pollution that most of us can no longer see the stars from where we live, so we have to go into space to see the booming stars. There are already thousands of pieces of debris whizzing around in orbit around the Earth. NASA keeps tracking them because they're very dangerous. They're the remains of spent rockets and deceased vehicles, right down to stray nuts and bolts. Some of them very small, but all traveling at 25,000 miles an hour. Miles a second, I'm sorry. So it's not great if they hit you. This is some of the stuff we've done. Some of the less glamorous stuff we've done. But I, I take much more seriously the mess that we've made of the planet. I would like to look, I'm sorry it's painful, but I'd like to look just a little bit more at the destruction, the pollution, our effect on the Earth. Buzz said that getting to Mars will be good for us. We will learn to conserve and recycle on Mars. 
It will teach us to be better people. I know that's true, but I can't help asking if it might be better if we learn to conserve and recycle and be better people before we colonize Mars. It's hardly necessary to point out every detail of the way we've treated our planet, how in only a couple of hundred years we've driven so many land animals into extinction and are well on the way to doing the same to the creatures who live in the sea, how we have stripped the planet of most of its vegetation, the very lungs of the world on which we depend for air, how we have pumped so much pollution into our atmosphere that we can't actually tell if we're causing global climate change or not. Question, question, is this the kind of behavior we're going to take into space? Every species of animal currently living on Earth, each is a triumph of evolution. Logically, it would seem to me that each of them have the same rights to a decent life and a decent death as human beings. But somehow, in the rush to propagate our species, the notion came into our heads that really, somehow, man was the only species that mattered. So we now calmly justify the expendability of every animal on the planet in the name of advancing our own progeny. Suppose we find that intelligent life that we're so excited about looking for. Suppose Jill Tarter finds it tomorrow. Suppose we bump into it out there. How will we treat it? How will we behave? At this moment, billions of animals are confined in degrading and foul conditions. Many bred for nothing but to make the most profit out of food production. Sentient creatures, sentient creatures, mammals, cows, pigs, plus chickens, turkeys, many of them so hide hideously genetically manipulated that they live a life of constant pain, only to be subjected to a violent premature death, their tortured bodies heading out in a shrink wrap onto supermarket shelves. If you want to know more about that, please read Eating Animals, the book by Jonathan Livingston Foer. It has all the details. Question, is this the kind of behavior we want to take into space? At this moment, billions of mammals, sentient, cognizant creatures, are confined in pitiful conditions, deprived of any sensory experience, tortured in the name of scientific research medical research, the making of cosmetics, and other lame excuses. I've personally been working with the Hadwin Trust in the UK, which has already demonstrated that progress in medicine may actually be accelerated by the replacement of all animals used in medical research, because it eliminates so many pointless and irrelevant experiments, which are inconclusive because most animals react differently from, to humans from most drugs anyway. The most tragic demonstration of this being the thalidomide case some years ago. This was a drug passed by animal exper experimentation as safe for humans, leading to its prescription as a cure for nausea for pregnant women, and the result was multiple birth defects, carving a hole in a whole generation of babies. Question, is this the kind of behavior we'll take into space? Can you take one more? At this moment, birds are being bred in tiny boxes to be released on British moors in a condition in which they basically can't fly properly at all. So they can be mown down by armies of men with guns in the name of sport. At this moment, gangs of men on horseback are lying about what they're doing out in the countryside in Britain, claiming that their packs of hungered dogs accidentally stumbled upon a fox and tore it limb from limb. Yeah. They call it fox hunting, even though it's now illegal in Britain. They call it a sport. They claim that torturing a wild animal to death in the name of sport is a human right, even though this concept was actually roundly thrown out in the European court in 2009. Question, is this what we'll take into space? At this moment, backed by the governments, they've helped to install farmers whose intensive farming methods have led to the proliferation of disease in livestock and subsequently to the infection of the wild animals around them are clamoring for the slaughter of the wild animals whose lives have already been blighted by these diseases. The British government has recently announced its determination 
to cull our native badgers, in spite of the fact that scientific experiments involving the death of 11,000 badgers prove that the culling of badgers will not even contribute to what they're trying to achieve, which is the control of bovine TB in cattle. Is this disregard for the welfare of animals what we will take into space? Okay, perhaps enough, painful enough. That's how we treat the other species on our planet. But how do we treat our own kind? Armstrong and Aldrin planted a worthy plaque on the moon, which we saw this week, saying, we come in peace in the name of all mankind. And I don't doubt for one second that this thought was in their hearts and their mind. But think back, what did we do walking through that other door the gentle, peace-loving Pilgrim Fathers opened the door that led to that other new world. Well, perhaps we came in peace, but we all but exterminated the indigenous population, the North American Indians, along with the buffalo with which they were interdependent. And we enslaved the people of Africa because we thought they were less deserving than us of freedom and dignity. Slavery was abolished by Wilberforce about 1833, less than 200 years ago. But we know that human trafficking is still rife. Young labor is imported to all Western countries, kept in conditions of no contact with the outside world. Right now, children are trafficked to be used for the pleasure of perverts in an industry which is spread out across the so-called civilized world. Children are made to work the so-called toxic dumps seeking out chemicals for the profit of men, chemicals which will ultimately kill them. And then worse, the people who keep them enslaved make them endure sexual abuse in return for pickings of the best toxic waste. Lovely. We fight wars for territory. We fight wars for political power. We call ourselves peacekeepers, yet we use our might to make war in impoverished countries, often protecting regimes of questionable morals. We play God attempting to change the leadership of countries to suit, sometimes, our own economic needs. I guess what I'm saying is our record of abuse to animals is pretty much matched by our abuse to our own kind. You may disagree on some of the details, but I think the principle is there. So my question is, do we take this into space? Is this what we take? Do we take all of this into space? If we allow large numbers of men to go into space, who is to stop a country building a military base on the moon? Or perhaps on a conveniently placed asteroid, a conveniently hard to monitor place, and using this base to bring about the next Hiroshima, the next act of destruction committed in the name of keeping peace, or spreading what we call democracy. Perhaps the next Hiroshima will be New York, or Moscow, or London. Suddenly the conquest of space takes on a very heavy overtone. We all know the story of Copenhagen, the story of the agonies of indecision of Oppenheimer and his colleagues on whether or not to give the secrets of making an atom bomb to their governments. And we know what the result was. It's too late to take back the nuclear bomb from the politicians of the world, but it may not be too late to look at that door that now leads into space, no, surely not to close it, but at least put some regulation on it to stop the proliferation of man's foul temper, man's aggressive behavior out into the hitherto untouched cosmos. Is it possible for scientists and artists, men of understanding and empathy, like I feel in this room, to take a moral stand, to take hold of the reins of future exploration of space, to make laws governing the further exploitation of lands outside the Earth, perhaps to contain the evils we have wrought in our own world and behave decently out there. Maybe that door could be held ajar just for a little while, while we, while we turn our attentions to the millions of people on this planet who are starving or dying of diseases which are curable 
and yet they can't afford the cure. There would be many more extreme than me who would question whether even one more rocket should be fired while there is still one child dying unnecessarily, while there are still people suffering torture because of their beliefs and animals suffering, suffering torture for our pleasure. Is it a lost cause? Must we conclude that man in bulk is indeed unworthy to step off the tiny blue world, which is all but destroyed in his folly? I sincerely hope not. I'm, I have to say again, I'm sorry to have caused this, this feeling of negativity, if that's what it is. I actually agonized even last night as to whether I ought to give this talk at all. Nobody in this world loves the pursuit of knowledge more than I do. I love the simple beauty of science, the simple beauty of discoveries which enrich our lives, just as I love the simple beauty of music which feeds our souls. I was also a boy who dreamed of being a spaceman. Dan Dare was my hero from the Eagle comic, a fictional man of honor, courage, and moral rectitude, just like the great men we have among us today the real-life astronauts of our time. We have heard each one of these men express their determination that the future of space will be shared by all nations. Sitting in my room last night, I didn't be the one to doubt that the rest of the human race couldn't pull it off. But there is a very positive side to all this, to be asking this question at this time. I believe this is an opportunity I believe that if we ask this question and take enough time to ensure that we get the right answers, we actually have a chance of a new start for mankind. And many of the people who can make this difference to the world in the future, to our world in the future, are in this room. If, you, if we don't ask this question right now, and take some action to ensure that we get the right answers, who will? Okay, for the last time I ask the question, if we do open this door wide, can we, as concerned scientists, artists and human beings, find a way to propagate just the decent parts of our civilization? Not cruelty, but empathy and compassion. Not greed, but generosity. Not conflict, but cooperation. Not war, but peace. The spirit in which we see these astronauts go. Peace in which all men, all women, all creatures can share the glorious gifts of nature. The glorious gift of life. For now, in a sense, I feel we are all participants in a new Copenhagen. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, you. Mr. Brian May. Now we're going to have just a few for questions, just a few questions. Now shoot me down. <laughs> <laughs> Any question around? Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry there were no jokes. Everything clear. <laughs> I'll do some guitar later on. <laughs> Madam, I'm honored. <laughs> Deeply honored, Jill. Actually, maybe your door will stay somewhat closed for a reason that we, we're we creating another tragedy of the commons in space with all of the debris. We're so close to a Kistler syndrome where the debris on debris collisions exponentiate that we may lose low Earth orbit for a hundred years or more it's until we clean it up or until it rains out. So maybe wow. there will be some time Wow. from oh. our own folly a to let us sort this out. Yeah, it's not too easy to clean up, is it? Wow, amazing. I didn't know that. It's that bad, huh? Thank you. I enjoyed your talk immensely. Thank you. Incredible. 
Any more questions? Last question. Uh, so do you think there is a way to reach the politicians or I don't know whoever is in more in charge of the world the people who have power um, I think there are ways I do my little bit in the UK I try to um, I'm involved in a campaign which, which is centered around wild animals um, because I think that's one of the things which need addressing immediately. And yes, I lobby and I make a lot of noise and I use what notoriety I have to try and make people ask questions. Um, but the reason I wanted to do this in this room was because we all have such contacts. We have, this room must have so much power within it and the combined power must be huge. You know, we can all go back to our politicians and maybe just just start asking more questions and, and demanding answers, demanding guarantees that the way we will proceed will be worthy of the start that's been made. Just the last, the last question. Sure. It's kind of... <laughs> Uh, hello, Brian. Um, I don't know if you're aware that, you know, talking about reaching politicians, there's a movement going on here in Spain, people going out to the streets and saying that they want a real democracy, a real uh, uh, people serving people. Um, I don't know what you think of that and if you think that's the way to not only solve problems here on Earth, but also take to space what, what we should. I think it's very significant, and I noticed that a lot of these new move movements are linked by the internet. Things are very different now. It used to be that only certain people had a voice, but now we all have a voice. We can all get on there and blog, we can tweet. I actually don't tweet, I don't understand tweeting. But in theory, <laughs> in, I can't tweet. But, But we all have a voice more than ever, and I notice that a lot of these campaigns are linked in this way, and I think it's very significant, and every part of it is significant. Um, I hope I didn't come across as being too kind of um, judgmental in any way. You know, I regard myself as, a, as an ignorant person who is trying to find out the truth, and the only way to find out the truth is to keep asking the, the questions. Um, and I hope that, the, um, that this conference will continue in a high tone because there is so much magic here, true magic, and I thank you for your patience in listening to my carping. Thank you very much, Mr. Graham.